Hello, Lisbon. I have a very serious question for you right now. Who here knows how a microwave oven works well enough to build me a brand new one from scratch? Any takers? Who knows microwaves? All right, I see a hand. A hand going up. I'm impressed. Different question for you now. Who here has never used a microwave to cook food? Anybody? Okay, uh, we, have, we have some interesting attendees. Usually I have no takers for either one, but I got one hand for the first question and a couple of hands here for the second question. Now, what I want to know from the majority of you who don't know how a microwave works, why do you trust that thing? And why do you cook with it? You just told me you cook with it, but you have no idea how it's wired. Why do you trust it? Why do you use it? Well, you're not going to trust it by reading the wiring diagram, are you? You're going to trust it because you're going to check that it does what you need it to do for you. And that is exactly what you're going to do with machine learning. Now, what they don't tell you about machine learning is that there's actually two machine learnings, though everyone makes it sound like one. And these two disciplines are as different as building microwaves from scratch and innovating in the kitchen at scale. Now, the one that all the university courses are about is research machine learning. That is about building general purpose tools for other people to use. Now, if you want to be a machine learning researcher, of course you're going to need to know how that microwave works because your job is to build a new and better one. And how are you going to do that if you don't know how this one works? But let's face it. Most of you just want to get cooking already, don't you? You actually want to use tools that other people have built, if you can, to innovate in the kitchen. And you'd prefer not to reinvent the wheel. Now, I have great news for you. There are warehouses upon warehouses of these microwaves already waiting to go, waiting for you to use them. Now, unfortunately, what I see is the world encouraging you to first learn how to wire your own microwave instead of cooking. The reason for that, I think, is that that is the way that these courses have always been taught. They have only been courses in the algorithms piece for machine learning and AI. But now that this technology is here already and it's available, don't listen to those folks who tell you that you have to build your own from scratch. Now is the time to get creative. Now, there's a reason that businesses fail at machine learning, even though it's so abundant. And that is that the way that they try to cook at scale to open their equivalent of McDonald's globally is they hire themselves 20 people who've spent their lives building microwave components rather than cooking, right? They hire 20 PhD researchers in AI to run this kitchen. What could possibly go wrong? Now, if that doesn't go wrong, that's because they got lucky, because they hired someone who just so happens to be an amazing chef in addition to a wonderful engineer. We should be talking about this. But we aren't. The world is training people to build more, more, more microwaves. Who is teaching us how to use them? At Google, we are trying to change this. We've started training our own staff in the applied side, which we're calling decision intelligence, in how to actually use machine learning and data to create real things to improve the world around us. So I want you to get excited, excited about actually using these things. But before we go any further, what on earth even is machine learning? I keep using that word and so does everyone else as if we've all agreed as to what it is. Now, I'm a statistician by training and we statisticians love to give things the simplest possible name so that it does exactly what it says on the tin. So if we had named 
machine learning, you know what we would have called it? Thing labeling. That's right. Let me show you how this thing labeling works so that you see it's not just a magical box of magic. So how does it work? You're going to take your data, which is your ingredients in the kitchen. Here we got two data inputs, and we are supposed to label things as the red dots or the blue triangles. Your entire job is to put a fence somewhere here to separate them. So where might you put a fence? How about there? I hope you see horizontal across isn't a good idea. Now what the machine learning algorithm does is figures out where to put the fence. That is its job. Based on these data, where should the line, the boundary go? And that thing doesn't need to be a straight line like I've got here. It can be a bunch of vertical and horizontal lines, or it can be some really squiggly things. In fact, those gobbledygook names for algorithms, they really refer to the different types of separating boundary that you can have. And when that algorithm is finished, well, what comes out is what you've wanted all along, a model. Now, what's a model? That is just a recipe. A recipe for taking in a new data point, there it is, and figuring out what to label it with, so red or blue, Red. See, it's easy. So why should you be excited by this simplistic thing labeling? This is a picture of my pet Huxley. And when you see this image, you know that that's a cat. And if I show you this one, you're not fooled. You still know that that's a cat, even though that image looks completely different. Now, if you want to automate this task, if you went the traditional programming way, you're going to need to find a way to take those pixels and convert them into the label cat. And so what you're going to do, you know this programmers, the way programmers do this task is they communicate in some way with the universe, think really hard about the problem, right? And then come up with a recipe as explicit instructions as code for the computer then to follow, to take those pixels and turn them into the label cat. But think about what that recipe must be. I mean, what did your brain do with that pixel information? Can you express that? Can you tell me how you knew that those things were cats? That's pretty tricky, isn't it? Because your brain has the benefit of eons of evolution and now it just does this, and you don't even know how your brain does it. It just does. And so it's really hard for you to express what those instructions must be. You don't know how you do it, so how do you tell the computer to do it? Wouldn't you much prefer to say to the computer, hey computer, here's a bunch of cats, here's a bunch of not cats, figure it out. Wouldn't you much prefer to express your wishes with examples instead of explicit instructions. Well, that is the key of machine learning. That's what machine learning is. Traditional programming is where you have to tell the computer what you want with an instruction. And in machine learning, you tell it what you want by showing it examples. And what's amazing about this and why you should care is that for some tasks, it's just really hard to come up with the instructions. Those instructions are ineffable. And machine learning, AI, this is about automating the ineffable. It doesn't matter that you cannot say how to do it. You can use examples to get the computer to figure out that task for you. That's amazing. That's a fundamental leap in human progress. Because again, some tasks you just cannot express the instructions for. This unlocks a whole class of new possibilities. So how do you get started? Well, you change your focus from how does the task work, that's for making instructions, to what examples would be useful, and examples here are data, and then how do we know that it actually has worked? How do we check? And so we're going to be in the mindset then of thing labeling. This is thing labeling after all. And your label 
might be something like, is the baby food ingredient safe or spoiled? This is a real example. All of these examples are real machine learning applications done on Google Cloud Platform. So the label here, baby food ingredient, safe or spoiled, so that you can catch the bad ones and they don't hurt kids. Or is a pixel snow or clouds? So this one is really hard to do by eye. Or how do you set the cooling system for a data center? Now that one, you could sit there manually toggling all the dials, or you could hand it over to an AI system. And when we did this at Google, when we used to uh, handcraft our solutions, when we would try to make an improvement with an analytical approach and find some better ways to adjust our code, we might get a one to 2% improvement in energy efficiency. When we handed this over to AI, we got a 40% improvement for zero. That is incredible. That's not just money saved. That's an incredible reduction in carbon footprint. If you wanted to caption this speech that I'm giving right now, you could sit there and your label would be the words and you could sit there doing it by hand or you could do it with machine learning and AI. Or you could come up with the winning move in a game of Go. That's also a label or a decision. Or which way to turn the steering wheel in a self-driving car. All of these are real examples. Now, when you are thinking about this, let me actually give you another tip for how to find good applications. Because this seems to be a stumbling point. The algorithms are there. The world's collecting plenty of data. So how do you apply it? What do you apply it for? Here's a neat trick. I want you to imagine that it's all the hooks. There is no machine learning. Instead, I want you to imagine that there's some island in the ocean somewhere, and it's full of people behind cubicles, and they're pretending to be machine learning. So you're going to send them a photograph, and they are going to quickly type back cat for you. Or you will send them some information about the state of your data center, and they'll adjust a little knob to set the cooling system. If I gave you use of that island with its millions of cubicle workers for almost free, what would you use them for? What drudgery would you cut out of your life so you wouldn't have to do those repetitive tasks? And as you're thinking about that, you are coming up with the right applications for machine learning, but wait. You don't know how drunk these people are. Don't just trust them with your important tasks. You need to be able to check whether or not they can do your task for you. And so you need to pick tasks where if it's important for the task to be done right, where you can say what it means to do that task right. And then what you're going to do is what a professor does with a human student. You are going to test them and see whether they have understood your task, whether they have learned it. Because one of the, the principles here is when you communicate with your island of drunk people, you can only communicate with examples, no explicit instructions. So once they have learned the task from those examples, what are you going to do? Same thing as what a professor does. Give them an exam. Now, since you already know as professors or their victims, you already know that a student could cheat on an exam and memorize their way to victory. And the student might not have learned the task at all, so imagine an exam on, I don't know, calculus, let's say. Your student might not understand how to do the calculus. They might just write the same answer as they had in their in-class and practice examples. So how would you catch that kind of cheating? How would you make sure that they actually understand the general principle? I tell you what you won't do. You won't open up their brain and see how they do the calculus, right? You're not going to go poke around in there with a scalpel. And neither will you do that with machine learning. Instead, what you're going to do is you're going to grab a series of questions that they have not studied from, that they've never seen before, and you're going to check that they actually can do the task for you. 
And so it is testing that keeps you safe with machine learning. You don't understand how your student's brain does calculus. You might not understand how your machine learning system's recipe looks. That doesn't matter. You're going to check that it does work. But it's important that you check on relevant examples. If you have, if you want to make a student who is calculus enabled, make sure that you are not training and testing them on Japanese English vocabulary pairs. That's not going to help you. So people tend to say the word data with a capital D, and this always worries me. Data is just examples. There should be a lowercase d there. It's just like the examples in textbooks. Just because you have textbooks doesn't mean that your student's going to learn something useful. If those textbooks are full of nonsense, you won't get the student you were looking for. So professors, of course, what you must do is open up those textbooks and make sure that what's in there is relevant, that those examples are good. To learn from examples, you need good examples. So I suggest to our Google engineers and to you as well, when you think about going near machine learning, consider tattooing this sentence on yourselves. The world represented by your data is the only world you can expect to succeed in. In other words, whatever is in the textbook is the only thing your student will learn. The textbook here is the data set. And I want to tell you one more thing about both data sets and textbooks. Humans author those things. They come from humans. They are written by humans, by human engineers in the case of data sets. And so they will reflect those engineers who collect them. That means that there's a layer of subjectivity in all of this stuff. And so it is your responsibility as the leader here, the decision maker, the professor, to think about what you are asking your students to learn, humans and machine students. And the rest of it really is much easier than most people think. The hardest part is figuring out what is worth doing and how you will know that it has worked and has done for you what you needed it to do. That's hard part number one. And then the other part is having the discipline to check that on new data, on new examples. And the rest of it, the tools and the infrastructure, the algorithms, they are there for you to play with. And you can, as a chef, go and tinker and dabble and play with these things, but please make sure that you take the time to taste what you have made. Don't just trust that the microwave works and serve the dish immediately. Taste it and make sure that it's what you want. So applying this stuff and focusing on application, that is where the opportunity is. It's an opportunity to make your data much more useful than ever before. So I hope that you're excited. Your machine learning adventure awaits. Thank you very much.